nursery. So it's got a <laughs> unusual little <laughs> style, mainly because of the conference. So it's a pleasure to have Amit Bhutan with us. So Amit did his uh, PhD from TRFL long back, working at that time on uh, the effects of strong disorder in superconductors. And uh, he has been working on uh, disordered electronic systems, particularly looking at uh, emergent phenomena. He is now continuing this line of study in uh, ISA. Okay. Thanks, Pratap. It's, it's really great to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank the organizer for this uh, ICMS uh, for this opportunity of presenting some of the things that we have been uh, carrying out in ISAR Kolkata. So the uh, title of the talk is Signature of Glassy Behavior Associated with Melting of Coulomb Cluster. So this is, I'll explain all of it. I mean, don't worry about this thing. But let's try to see what the broad plans are. Should we have this light off? Yes. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> so we will. So we will study Coulomb interacting particles, long range interacting particles in two dimensional confinement. We will particularly access the static and dynamic responses of a system of the system like this across melting, melting of something like a self formed solid in confinement. By long range, is it log or one over r? Uh, no, this is one over r. So it's cool. I mean, particles are confined in 2D, but the field lines are 3D. That's right. Uh, right. Okay. And then we will look into both thermal as well as quantum melting, but I'll focus mostly on thermal melting for the purpose of the talk. So that's the classical melting. We will, towards the end, we'll motivate the quantum part where actually we are working right now. Uh, uh, the objectives are the following. So first of all, we want to explore the spatiotemporal correlation in systems uh, where the system size is of the range of interaction. And it's important, particularly the next one, that we'll look at the effect of disorder. So disorder, as you know, makes systems inhomogeneous. Now, inhomogeneities will be very interesting when there is a long range interaction. Basically, they become somewhat long lived. And we'll, we'll, we'll un try to understand that. And then we'll try to understand, based on our results, whether there we can access some of the generic signatures of disordered dynamics in confinement. So the pictures, this is something we'll talk about. So the system is like this. If you look, uh, I mean, if you think this dots like a particle, so this is actually the trajectory of particle. And then you heat them up, they will start move around, jiggling around, and they will melt. And we'll try to understand the physics associated with such melting. This is the most symmetric circular. I mean, this is like a trap which has a parab circular parabolic symmetry. That's the most symmetric confinement you can have in two-dimensional system. So that is that will be like for us an undisordered system. Is there an underlying classic potential also or not? No. And we'll see what how we introduce disorder later on. So now I'll mention that the, whatever we are going to describe, our major part of it is the PhD <laughs> thesis of my student uh, at ISA Kolkata, Bishwarup Ash who has moved to uh, postdoc position now recently. OK. <coughs> so, so, uh, the, so let's start with some motivation. So Coulomb interacting particles have been in, in condensed matter physics for, for a very long time, uh, since 1934. So at least part, some aspect of Coulomb interacting particles were known. So it is known that such particles form a regularly ordered pattern, which is known as Coulomb uh, sorry, Wigner crystal. Uh, so that is formed because Coulomb repulsion forces particles to stay as far apart from each other, of course, consistent with the density. And that produces this periodic pattern like Wigner crystal. You can think of these black dots as, as the particles which, are, which have arranged themselves in a triangular lattice orientation in 2D. That's the Wigner crystal in 2D, triangular lattice. So now, you can melt the Wigner crystal, and that will come because of a competition between kinetic and potential energy. So potential energy, which is Coulomb repulsion, tries to uh, sort of localize them, and uh, kinetic energy delocalize them. 
So in 3D, this will be a body-centered cubic. That's what Wigner did. I mean, this is a simple calculation that you can do, the energy minimized configuration that you can have. So now the kinetic energy can be provided uh, by two sources. I mean, one is of classical nature, classical or thermal, where the, this is provided by the temperature. So th there will be thermal jiggling around. And it could be quantum, the zero point fluctuation, which will lead to quantum melting. So we will first focus on the classical part. I mean, that is most of uh, the talk today. So now, uh, so this is whatever I said are mostly uh, known for two dimension, uh, sorry, bulk system. So bulk system, there are interesting question whether Wigner, realize, Wigner melting is realized in bulk and uh, there are interesting experiments. But we are not going to talk about bulk system from now on. Instead, we'll confine what are known as Wigner molecules. So Wigner molecule is just the finite size version of Wigner crystal. So for example, this is what I was telling you. So this is like a Wigner molecule. So it's if you put, if you confine it in a finite size. So of course, you know that I mean, in a finite size, you don't really have a crystal. You don't define a phase. But modulo that, we will define. We'll talk about melting by understanding them as a finite size crossover and so on. So forth. But still, the, the Coulomb physics will probably show up. And that's what we are going to try to understand. So this, has, this can be realized in various different <laughs> experimental setup. I just uh, present one here, which is called dusty plasma setup. So you set up a plasma environment by, uh, at a very, very uh, low pressure by flowing some highly reactive gas like silane uh, mixed with argon, some such thing, which etches, etches up uh, particles like silicon oxide particles from silicon wafer. Now, in a sorry, in a in a strong electric field, they actually get levitated. These particles, which are which ionize because of the, the strong charge, they get levitated and form something like a crystal like this. I mean, so so uh, and this levitation is because of the competition with gravity and this sta electrostatic field and so on and so forth. And then you can tweak them in various means by laser. Laser is one of the sources. You can heat them up by putting laser. You can, we can use laser for a tweezer. You can move them and try to see how the system relaxes. You can do all sorts of things, uh, uh, all sorts of things uh, experimentally. And that is perhaps one of the reasons for which uh, this, I mean, basically, you have, uh, my, I mean, uh, OK, I, I, it is probably fair to say that you have ultra tunability in experiments on finite size system, which makes them very popular as a playground for understanding the strong correlation effect. and various different things. So, so you by doing that, I mean, basically here you're changing the laser power and, he, and thereby heating it up and thereby making the particle jiggle around everywhere and melt them. So this is something that we'll keep in mind. We'll try to understand the effect of disorder on them. And then there are very interesting dynamics that occur across melting. So like this is a case where you have air driven steel beads which form like a colloid. So they're under motion. There is some, some phenomena called dynamic heterogeneity. So you, you color coded the particles, which are according to their mobility. So the most mobile particles are like red one, and then it decreases according to this. So it's like you have some special clumping of particles, heterogeneous bunch of particles that, that forms, forms self-generated. I mean, uh, this uh, uh, string of particles with different uh, mobility in the middle of something which has a, di uh, a different mobility. You also study relaxation of localized sta uh, uh, stress in experiments. So you have something like this, and then you, you use optical tweezer to pull one guy apart and see how the defect relaxes. I mean, that will create a defect, how that relaxes. So such things, I mean, these are different phenomena, all of which we would like to address by studying. I mean, not really exactly this problem, but problems of similar nature can be addressed by doing some theoretical calculation, which we uh, go ahead with. So now I talk to, you, uh, talk to you about disorder, that we want to study the effect of disorder on such uh, uh, on, uh, disorder. So the way we introduce disorder, and this is certainly not the unique way, but this is one way, that you squeeze the potential. So this was most symmetric potential, which is the undisordered case that we considered. And here we have squeezed them some way. But we have to squeeze them in a way which behaves like, I mean, which results into a disordered situation in which way that we'll do it such that it breaks all the spatial symmetries which is required for a disordered situation. And secondly, 
the classical motion because we are going to look at classical dynamics so classical dynamics in this is chaotic fully chaotic so fortunately and this could be done by various different potential but good thing is that we know one at least which is a quartic oscillator potential parameterized by uh, two quantities lambda and gamma uh, which this this introduces chaoticity and this is the one that breaks the reflection symmetry and so on so forth so this is studied very well so that people know that the single particle dynamics in this in this trap is fully chaotic at least within some range of lambda and gamma moreover you can choose different sets of lambda and gamma which will which will lead to the same chaoticity meaning same lyapunov exponent or similar lyapunov exponent such that you can do a disorder averaging of your results on such configurations the thing that you would like to do in general yeah No, so it will be localized. So, so right. So we are not going into that. So our disorder is that way weak disorder. So because it will be essentially living on the boundary. So like uh, the disorder is, uh, I mean, disorder length scale is much bigger than the interparticle spacing. Let's say so we are always in that limit. So random plane wave and things like that. Right. So, but one can certainly do the other thing, and we are actually doing it now that you put impurities. So there we can do what you are saying, right? Okay, so that's the motivation about this. So the good thing is that we had this uh, information available, and one actually have looked into various other things uh, uh, with this potential. So uh, we can discuss that later. And okay, so our computational tool will be uh, classical molecular dynamics and classical Monte Carlo, very uh, standard method with simulated handling at finite temperature. And then for quantum problem, we are developing, we have developed, and we are, we are in the process of developing further path integral quantum Monte Carlo uh, at low finite temperature, as well as variation and diffusion Monte Carlo at, uh, at zero temperature. These are uh, involved techniques, and I'm not going to discuss the techniques as such. Uh, OK, so now let me give you the idea of what, what really the melting is, some pictorial description. So I said, I mean, this is a similar picture that I have shown, but this is from simulation, that these are like trajectories over a finite uh, length of time, you can say, or Monte Carlo uh, uh, snapshots. These are at very low temperature, so particles are just jiggling around their equilibrium position. Uh, and then there's some other um, particles towards the boundary are moving a little bit more, the one towards the center moving a little bit less. But as you increase the temperature, the jiggling increases. So it's like the random vibration of particles around their equilibrium position. And then beyond some point, there will be some, uh, some occasional jump ac along across, the, uh, across the rings. And then finally, particles will be diffused everywhere. So that's my melted state. And even lower temperature than this will be a real solid. Zero temperature equivalent of that will be, will be the solid phase. Solid within confinement modulo finite size system and so on. So so this is the melting we'll be looking into. And this is now the disordered situation. So this is one such configuration once I put the particles in a disordered trap. So disorder in that sense. I mean, basically, all symmetries are broken. So now there's something, I mean, this is qualitatively, I mean, or broadly similar. But to begin with, I mean, you, I can uh, draw your attention that this, this seems to be something very different, that the melting or pre-melting starts by moving some particles over long distances where many others are just rattling around their equilibrium position. So this must be something different when you put in disorder. And this is the part we we uh, we try to explore uh, uh, henceforth. So those simulations are classical? These are all classical simulations. So is it just because that the particles are farther apart from each other in the center, and therefore it's going to require less thermal energy to, to disturb the order? Uh, well. Uh, the thing is, I mean, this is one configuration. I mean, in general, there is no particular region where you can generate this uh, delocalization. You are trying to say that this, this local is more towards center. That's no, not, no, not center, oh. But where particles are farther apart from each other. Uh, well, par if I guess that is true. I mean, that is uh, uh, statistically true. But these things occur over a large distance, as you see. And uh, there, I hope the reason is something different, and we'll we'll try to explain that. 
So now to identify that there is something like a melting or rather a finite size crossover, we quickly calculate few things which are very standard in literature. You can look at the Lindemann ratio which is a very old concept that you look at the mean square displacement of particle from their equilibrium position. So at very low temperature in solid they remain close to zero, very low temperature and then there is a range where they rise somewhat sharply, not very, very sharply like what you expect for a bulk system and then goes into something else. So this region, I would say that this is a region of melting and this is the, I mean if less disorder you have, this will be narrower, the, the regime of melting. You can look at the specific heat and by changing the total number of particles in this, uh, in this trap, you can see that the specific heat peak uh, gets sharper as you go to larger and larger system. And this thing occurs exactly at the same temperature, which is sort of midpoint of this, which gives you a little bit more uh, confidence on that. You could look at something else also, and which is very important, that these are classical particles in two dimension. So we know that in two dimension, you have a positional order as well as a bond orientation order. So here we look at the bond orientation order. So what is bond orientation order? In a, in a, in a hexagon, I mean in a tri triangular lattice, you have one particle and all its nearest neighbor are in a, in a, arranged such a way that there is a 60 degree angle between all of them. So you take advantage of that to define a bond orientation order or order parameter locally for every particle, this thing, such that when it is 60 degree, this will become one. So this is defined that way because all these thetas are 60 degrees. So thetas are angled like this, 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 and all that. Okay, so what it says that you have that order, so even if the positional order is broken, meaning you have some wiggly lattice line, you still can have a good healthy bond orientation order. That's the hallmark of 2D system or what is known as KTHNY theory, Coastalist, Howless, Salpin, and Nelson, Young theory. So what we plot here is that this is temperature evolution of the distribution of this order parameter which is called psi 6. So psi 6 is the bond orientation order. So in a perfect triangular lattice, this distribution will be a delta function at uh, uh, this uh, psi 6 equals 1. So as temperature increases, so we don't, we have a finite, si a finite size system uh, with the boundary and all that. So even at very low temperature, it is not a delta function, but still rather sharp peak towards uh, 1. And as you increase temperature, the distribution broadens and then finally at large temperature, it's all over. So the, the angle being 60 degrees, uh, each angle being 60 degrees is no more true. It's basically uh, distributed over a large range of angles. So this, this change of distribution is a signal that this is the solid is softening or bond orientation order is softening. Is this, uh, local bond orientation order? Right. So this is this is uh, mod, but uh, but you can you can look at the I mean this is the amplitude, but actually we have checked that I mean so basically uh, this turns I mean the, the imaginary uh, I mean theta component is really small and that distribution always remains close to zero, I mean with zero width, right? Sorry, bond between the two successors. Two uh, yeah, uh, right. I mean so this makes a real tri triangular lattice. So there is always a particle at these locations, so like these dots are this and bond angle meaning this line with this line and then the next one and so on and so forth. So these are all, so basically these are iso, uh, I mean equilateral triangles with uh, 60 degree angles. So you delimit triangular equilateral? Uh, to do what? No, these are just. How do you get the nearest neighbor? Oh, that is the, uh, yeah, okay. So that, I mean Voronoi construction. Okay. Same thing, yeah, right. Sorry, I'm really sorry. Yeah. Uh, the locations of where these uh, I mean, uh, the locations are, I mean, triangular lattice is determined by the, uh, by the interaction. Uh, and then uh, the, the d distortion to that is decided by the external potential. Right. You are really looking at order parameters. Right. So why, 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 why I normally expect No, so that, that doesn't matter because all I am, uh, sorry, all I am looking at is whether these angles are 60 degree. Sir, do you also calculate some quantitative order Because once you have the external disorder potential, uh, the system 
Right. You get facial and uh, right. rotational disorder, but the system may not have lost stiffness uh, right. during the interaction. Uh, what we should be looking at probably is the stiffness. If that goes away, then it must be nice. Right. So, so basically, we look at yeah. So, I will tell you a few other sorry, few other things. Uh, 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 so the yeah, so the, okay, so just uh, I mean, let me try to uh, describe this, and then you will probably see some. Uh, so for, first of all, from now on, every time I show two similar looking picture, on the left it will be from irregular confinement, that is the one with disorder, and on the right this will be circular. This is written CR for circular, so this is for circular confinement. So this is the at least the comparison of these two between these two kind of traps, which look very similar to each other. Next one, the one that I do, which is actually a better quantity in the sense that that is Okay, so let me tell you. So what we are looking at here is we look at what we call M6. That is the, uh, so you are asking, so there is a bond orientational order this way and then there is another particle little bit far which is bond orientation in a different direction. How much does this bond orientation of nearest neighboring particle fall on top of each other? Okay, so if you had to ask this not just nearest neighbor but very far as a function of R, that would be bond orientation correlation function. So this is like the first, uh, because it's a finite, sorry, finite system anyway. So we look at uh, the bond orientation, uh, uh, I mean bond orientation correlation function only up to nearest neighboring distance. So this, I mean this can be defined, I mean this is projection of psi 6 onto mean local field that I said. So this, when there is a bond, I mean when there is a good bond orientation or uh, correlation, then we will have a peak which is lying around the value 1 because both psi 6 and m6 are 1 and when you lose it bond orientation correlation then this will have a peak at 0. So this might help you to go from one to other of this bimodal distribution to track something like a melting temperature which is somewhere here where, where it is most flat or uh, I mean sort of mix of both. So that also matches with this temperature the crossover temperature we found. So this gives some kind of a, so basically we are trying to find some uh, some uh, 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 some finite size criteria to describe melting if there is any and this all look I mean the points towards the same thing. In addition we have studied the uh, pair correlation function and then uh, uh, pair I mean uh, bond orientation correlation function the standard stuff and the susceptibilities associated with that which will show a peak. Uh, near the, I mean, at the point of transition. So those are also consistent with uh, with the description that there is perhaps some uniquely defined melting temperature or crossover temperature in this system. So this regular one, mm -hmm. why is it uh, at zero zero two? Mm -hmm. Your regular one, circular one, seems to have a long shoulder, not the one below. Mm -hmm. Here. The red, if I look at the red curve, that has a long shoulder here. Yeah, so. The, the irregular one seems to be sharper from that. Sharper, yeah. Uh, I haven't thought about it. I was just, uh, I was considering mostly the broad, uh, this thing, whether I can, uh, but I will think about that. Uh, just yeah. Just mm -hmm. You had two, uh, two, two kinds of in, uh, energies, which were the particle particle interaction mm -hmm. and then the potential. Mm -hmm. Are you working in a regime, you probably can discuss some stuff, but are you working in a regime where the first energy is bigger than the second? Right, I mean in the sense that the, uh, the disorder is weak, it's yeah, okay. right. Uh, so now, okay, so what have we learned so far is that crossover from solid to liquid like behave it discerned, I mean from different independent observables. Yeah no apparent distinction of Tx between circular and irregular. If you look at those, they will all look similar. Uh, and there is a range of number of particles. The thing is uh, for we in which this, I mean, you see something which is more generic. Uh, the results are generic. So what we would like to address is that uh, what can dynamics tell us about solid and liquid in traps? I mean, whether they can distinguish between uh, this thing and can motional signature distinguish between the crossover be, be based on whether it is circular or irregular trap and access or access to generic signatures. I mean something that I said. So this is sort of the motivation. So now let me go to the, uh, I mean let me tell you the final, I mean the most important result right away and then everything will be derivative of that. So
so what is really happening in the system so think of this system where i have so i have shown as dots the initial position of particle so you put the particle we are at a very low temperature which is supposed to be solid i mean below the melting or crossover temperature so at very small time all particles are locked so okay so the, the, the and the particles are connected the initial position by a short stick here to the final position the stick ends at the final position after time 100 i mean in some unit so this is a short time so now if you look at very low temperature there is hardly any motion of particles hardly any displacement however wherever there is any displacement you see that they try to line up meaning along this line i mean displacement are roughly along the same direction but then particles don't move until a long time at which point suddenly there is a specially correlated motion that sets in so what happens here i mean uh, so that's the understanding until until that time so some large number like 1000 instead of 100 in some unit particles were like caged like every particle cannot move because there are other repelling neighbors and they are caged within uh, caged in their equilibrium position now because there is temperature there will be occasional i mean there will be occasions when one particle will actually jump out of that cage okay something like an activated process but now imagine what happens once a particle jumps out of the cage it will be in a in a in a cage where there are now two particles which will not like each other so immediately one will jump out and then the next one will jump out and that way there will be a cascade of events and all these movements of particles by macroscopic or large distances will occur in a in a in a i mean th those will be all related by nearest neighbor like the one that is shown here okay so now imagine this situation this is very different from the garden variety liquid that we know where the motions the diffusive motions is what is correct which characterizes a liquid here there is a situation where this is what is called dynamic heterogeneity that there are some particles which are just rattling very little around their equilibrium position whereas many others are making macroscopic moves uh, in a string like path and then if you wait for longer it turns out that this this string like path actually extends and then breaks up into smaller and smaller uh, i mean smaller regions of individual individual macroscopic motions and this is what is uh, what is actually this is what is called dynamic heterogeneity in the sense that there are different different uh, uh, diffusivities in the system based on region so of course you can set up the same similar motion even for this case of circle however in this case the symmetry dictates which way it will go whereas for 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 the case where there is no symmetry it can be anywhere and it will just produce this but yeah right right so that is that is what is known as structural relaxation time yeah but that is but i we have 100 1000 and 9000 mm -hmm. that is go sort of monotonically towards 9000 or that is going bar no this this 9000 is actually starting from here i mean some zero so this is the final displacements of particles so particles have moved i mean this is just the final displacement but point Uh, so that, of course, I mean that depends on temperature. When you are at a large temperature, then it's always active. No, at low temperature, yes. I mean, uh, typically there is a. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that is true. But this is homogeneous in the sense that you can choose your time t equals four thousand as t equals zero, and then roughly on an after an average of thousand times, you will see this. So okay, so what we try, what we do uh, for the next part of the talk is basically quantify this interesting dynamical behavior and extract various different uh, uh, physical uh, quantities or uh, physical observables of the system. Okay, so so now uh, so right, so now the thing is, this is actually very common. I mean, in in literature which are glassy physics, where you have this. Uh, this kind of correlated motion in system in a string like path where one particle displaces 
the next one and the next one uh, displaces the next one and so on and so forth. This is very common, the stream-like uh, motion in a, in a large, long, tortuous path. So then uh, we actually try to see what are different features that we, uh, that we can get which, which can sort of uh, have similarities with glasses. So let's start with describing one result which is called, uh, uh, I mean this is, this is named as Van Hove correlation function, but this uh, co conceptually this is very simple. Uh, this GSRT, uh, GRT which is defined this way has a cell part which says that what is the probability of moving on an average distance r in time t, okay. The, yeah, I mean, I do only. Separately yeah, separately, separately. Separately. So, when you have so this is dynamic, so molecular dynamic. Right, right, right. No, no, that is certainly true. I mean, you have to start from a, a thermal distribution with uh, Maxwell Boltzmann velocity distribution and but so on. Uh, during the evolution, no, you basically, yeah, so the thing is right, I mean you are right. So normally molecular dynamics is done on microcanonical ensemble. Yeah. So there are various schemes by which you can make it mimic like a uh, canonical ensemble uh, simulation. Those are ad hoc, I mean that's the better method, but the thing is what it, where it matters is how you go to the equilibrium. But once you attain equilibrium, so what we do is what is called a velocity rescaling. So basically you, because of temperature, you change your velocity magnitude such that it is consistent with the equipartition theorem and all that. So those are taken care of. All of that goes into your initial state. Right. Ini I mean until it comes to equilibration. Initial meaning that's where my actual calculation starts. So right. yeah. In that then right. So, so this is this is as I say probability of move on an average distance r in time t. So now if you look at it, this is plotted in semi-log scale. So this, uh, let's say these are for different time. So this means that this uh, uh, this uh, purple curve looks very much like a Gaussian distribution because this is like square. I mean because it's a, a, a semi-log plot. So, so this, I mean, normally you would expect this thing to behave like a Gaussian, right? I mean, uh, so because in liquid particles move diffusively, even in solid, your motion is like phonon, which are quadratic in nature. On the other hand, if you wait for some time, I mean, it changes from Gaussian to something which is like exponential, a linear fall in semi-log plot, and then it, it becomes very, very slow fall. So very different from Gaussian. Same thing happens for circular. This at low temperature and uh, then at high temperature also this differs very significantly, particularly for irregular trap, this differs very significantly for, from a Gaussian distribution. So this is, a, this, this is a very, very long tail essentially. Okay, this looks closer to Gaussian and we will we'll try to analyze that. So, so basically it seems that irrespective of the temperature, even at large temperature where you, where you think the, the, the motions are random, even there it defies the uh, law of large number or central limit theorem. So now if you want to compare, I mean you could do always do the simulation within harmonic approximation. So what is the temperature unit here? It has changed somehow. No, this is still uh, 0 0.006 and okay. this is 0 0.6. T here? T, the small t, that is time. So these are at different time. Oh, okay. Huh? X axis is R, sorry, I mean this is very small. I mean distance, how far it can move. R in terms of R0, R0 being the lattice spacing, average lattice spacing at zero temperature. So Which one? This? I'll I'll tell you in a moment. Yeah, that's what I have. I have a I have a technical question. Huh. You are tracking each particle how much they have moved. Right. So how do I once a particle has moved by more than one lattice constant or let's say more than half lattice constant, how do you identify one particle? Oh, in theory they are classical particle, they are always stacked. No, no, this, okay, but how <laughs> do you do that? Because we do this same experiment with vortices, but then once it has moved by one lattice constant, how do I identify it? No, your job is far more difficult. For me, computer does it. I mean, it, 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 it's a classical particle, so there is no problem. 
I mean, uh, actually, it is more difficult to make them indistinguishable. I mean, you have to invoke quantum mechanics and all that, and then this is harder problem. So there could be even classical inequality. Okay, you can tag inequality. Right. Okay. Right, right, right. He knows. I know, I know which particle I am moving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the point is that what would be the metric if I would not identify the particle? So, okay. So now this is this is what I wanted to contrast with the uh, with the harmonic approximation. That means where you you allow particle only to do harmonic vibration at one of the equilibrium position, and then that remains Gaussian all along. And uh, so this is very different from, so this is harmonic approximation, which is often time thought as a classical melting mechanism, essentially. So this looks very different, the, this distribution. And so does the trajectory. So this is the actual trajectory around melting. I mean, little less than melting. I mean, melting, it, it will, and this is the harmonic theory. Harmonic theory is, of course, understood. I mean, that, that's constructed that way. They can only do a little bit of vibration. So the actual melting is, more more involved than or more interesting uh, whichever way you want to describe so now coming back to Rajdeep's question so now the fact that we see that there's a that has a long tail we would like to understand uh, or like to quantify what what how slow is the fall so for that we do the following we we take this quantity what we call GSRT and then this must behave I mean we found this to behave like a like a uh, 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 Gaussian at very small time and it must because at very small time at least it will do a ballistic motion right and then it must be must be gaussian uh, so 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 the, it has to be gaussian in some regime and then when it is with, when it does not look gaussian and avoiding the very long time this multi uh, for non monotonic behavior we get rid of the non monotonic behavior particularly at large temperature this is primarily non -mono, uh, sorry monotonic behavior I wanted to look at the monotonic part of it and we like to fit it to something like e to the r, uh, e to the minus I mean basically some kind of stressed exponential coefficient and do a thorough job with fitting with chi square and all that and power law everything that is possible we try and then in the end what we find that this is the best fit with the following following nature that now I am plotting this k remember k being 2 is a Gaussian behavior and k being 1 is exponential behavior and, and similarly. So now how does k behave as a function of time for different temperature? So, so it turns out that for very low temperature, red is this one, I mean, which is very low temperature. This actually starts with Ga Gaussian and then it boils down to something like an exponential. And such was, promo uh, such was uh, postulated as a, uh, a generic behavior of a glassy system, that it, at very low temperature, they would, they would have an exponential tail for glassy system. So we do have that, but we have more interesting situation that as you go to higher and higher temperature, this thing, this number at large time get lower than 1, so which means a stretched exponential decay, slower than exponential decay, which is often time, I mean, remember there is a special correlation that is decaying stressed exponential, which is, which is not so common. I mean, time, time decay stressed exponential is very common in glasses system, so this is what this system shows. What is even more interesting when it goes down, you ask, no, that cannot be true for very large temperature. Because at very large temperature and a very long time, I must get back my garden variety liquid. It must go to 2. And indeed, it does. So if you go, so what is very interesting that until the melting or crossover temperature, this comes from numerics only. I mean, I don't have a very strong reason for that. It goes down, but then it starts getting up. So this is like a very high temperature. So this is like 0.25, where it actually goes to 2 again, even in the irregular trap. On the other hand, circular trap, it almost always lies between 1 and 2. It, it, true that it goes to 1, which is exponential decay, but then again, it comes back to 2. So, so, so the, uh, right, so, so what is very interesting that the melting happens or the crossover happens at temperature like 0 0.02, which is the melting temperature, and it recovers the isotropic liquid behavior at very large time is only at a temperature which is 10 times larger. So for a decade, the decade of temperature, the system behaves as a very, very inhomogeneous liquid. So that is also a hallmark of so-called glassy system, that it, uh, that it remains inherently inhomogeneous. 
so having seen that so there, there so one can so i said that i would look at the okay i would not explain this too much for the sake of time so what but what we can understand also very well that what is the what how i mean we can actually comprehend the non monotonic behavior of this uh, function at low temperature and which again comes from dynamic heterogeneity that the that there are different regions different puddles of different mobility of particles uh, that can actually explain quantitatively the non monotonic behavior which i'll not explain uh, right now <coughs> so now once we got that i mean there are various things that one can calculate and i'll again go little fast on them uh, so one can ask what is the so basically what we are trying to now get uh, get out of it is various different time scales time scale i mean relaxation of different kinds so what one can ask how does this uh, six fold uh, six uh, how does the propensity of six coordinated neighborhood decay with time because in a liquid you, you i mean you or i mean as you uh, as you simulate for longer and longer time the six coordinate neighborhood will go away i mean it will be washed out in liquid the bond orientation order and that you can find out this way so this is like one particle that has a six coordinated neighborhood to begin with and then it that particle evolves in time and what is the correlation of that six coordinated neighborhood with itself and then we average over all particle and this is how it behaves this is actually pretty similar to what one one expects i mean uh, what is quoted in the in the, in the literature uh, according to kt yeah Mm -hmm. I didn't check that. I understand your question, but uh, we can check that. But uh, this is not checked. Yeah, thanks for. Uh, yeah, we, we should. So, so what I am showing here is that I mean, so basically, for very low, uh, uh, I mean, uh, temperature. Uh, so these are different temperature. Low temperature, they remain unaltered as a function of time. But then some intermediate temperature, there's a power law decay, which is very similar to the hexatic phase in a in a two-dimensional uh, melting. And then at very high temperature, I mean, beyond some temperature, there are exponential decays. That part is similar to, uh, similar to what one expects uh, in, in the theoretical framework. But what is interesting, that over the whole regime of power law decay, the power changes very little in the irregular trap than this one. This is, as you can see, that this is a cha continuously changing slope. Here, the slope remains almost same all along. So we don't understand that, but there's some observation. We have looked into mean square displacement. There are interesting observation on that I will not go get into. Then one can also look at what is called an overlap function. So one would like to understand what is the time scale, I mean, what is the temporal decay time scale. So one, uh, so basically the, the philosophy with which one calculates that as the particle relaxes, as the particle moves, the structure relaxes, structure of a solid. So from that, you can devise a time scale. So you say that if particle moves beyond some distance, then you will set some uh, binary uh, function between 0 and 1. And then you, for that particle, and you average over that, and how does that behave with time, and all that. And you can get some time scale. Uh, yeah, so you can get that. So that is what we do. I mean, I'm really moving a little fast. I'll just talk about, sorry, only one here, which is the, uh, uh, so, 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 so in this literature of glasses system, one, one very important crucial signature is the decoupling of what is called an exchange time and a persistence time. So persistence time is a particle gets displaced beyond the cutoff, let's say, for the first time. And then persistence exchange times are the successive moves by that distance. So remember, if you have dynamic heterogeneity, once a particle moves out, then they will very quickly move by larger distances. So these two will decouple very quickly in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a system with heterogeneity. Whereas if it is just vibrational motion, then there will be no difference between this time scale. So you try to take advantage of that. And we see indeed that for, I mean, so here, one is uh, the solid line is persistence time and the break broken line is the, uh, 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 the exchange time. And for irregular trap, these two decouple. I mean, the distributions decouple beyond some, I mean, beyond this uh, crossover temperature. So that way, this is a signature of glassy dynamics. For circle, there is hardly any. And then, you know, so there are certain statistical analysis you must do when you are comparing distributions and we, we take care of all of that. Uh, 
So then the sort of the uh, last but one topic uh, is to understand the normal modes in such system and this is, uh, this, this is a work which is unpublished, I mean which is, uh, which is nearly done and uh, but uh, yeah, so this is still part of it is ongoing. So uh, this is, uh, this addresses the dynamic responses by looking at normal modes. You know, we, we are familiar with normal modes because normal modes are basically, it, it actually tries to, uh, tries to see how the dynamics proposes to move particles in a configuration in which all the particles are under a collective motion, right? I mean, we do that for phonon, for crystals in, in our regular courses. So we wanted to do exactly same thing here. So the standard procedure is that you, you take normal modes. I mean, they, those are con constructed this way by, by taking the Hessian, uh, Hessian matrix. And then you find out their, uh, solve their eigen system, find out the eigen values, eigen vectors, and look at their distribution. So we are going to do exactly that. So the, re the, the question is, OK, so at this point, I will pause and at least define the question. So, so th the question that we would like to ask is, so these are systems where there is a slow dynamics, which is like a glassy system, for which it is like a glassy system. There is this decoupling of different time scale, for which it is like a glassy system. I didn't emphasize one point that this time scales that you can find has a dependence on temperature, such that this, this time scales go up as you go to lower temperature. I mean, so basically, for real glassy system, supercooled liquid, they follow a particular form called uh, vogel fulcher law, I mean, we, uh, I mean, we get something very similar. So now, can we predict which particles after a long time or after certain time will show more motion? So there is a dynamic heterogeneity in the system. So let's say I know the system at this point of time. Can we predict what will be the, which particles will have larger displacement after some time? So that's the question we are asking. So we would like to do that by understanding the normal modes of, a pa of, of this configuration, and then we'll predict what, where the displacements will be. Yeah. So is the H here is just the potential energy of it? No, H here is the potential plus, uh, I mean, uh, interparticle, I mean, the Hamiltonian, which is the. I mean, no, I was asking because the kinetic energy is not in the configuration. Huh, no, this is just the, this is just the potential energy. So, right, 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 right. So, so this is done for different configuration. There are two kinds of normal modes people analyze. One is instantaneous, which is at a finite temperature. Basically, the equilibrium configuration you generate by Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics with your e equilibrium configuration, and you do the normal mode analysis. Those are called instantaneous normal modes, and you find the eigenvalues, which are the Frequency and eigenvectors are the oscillation pattern, I mean, of mode. The other thing you do, and this is what we will be focusing on primarily, is what is called a quench configuration. I mean, energy minimized configuration. So this is, let's say, your Mo Monte Carlo or molecular dynamic simulation, that it is generating for you one configuration from there, the next time step, another configuration. At every instant, you quench it. That means you just let it go to the, go to the minimum energy solution. Okay, so you let it flow to the lowest energy possible. Uh, and then you come to what is called the inherent structure. So in a sense, you are trying to find out which are the, which are the, which are the metastable states, let's say. So those have the name of inherent structure. How do you let it go to the A conjugate gradient method and all that. I mean, there are, there are method. I mean, basically you minimize, so you start with a configuration at some temperature, but then you forget about temperature. You just I mean, you just, uh, in the potential, let it go by conjugate gradient. Yeah, you plug that in inner solution to your no, 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 I don't do that. So I just collect them. So it turns out that because it's a, I mean, because it's a, hopefully it's a glassy system and there are many such minima. So, so there will be several different instantaneous, I mean, Monte Carlo steps or molecular dynamic step, which will lead to the same inherent structure. So inherent structure being, I mean, they are called inherent structure like a metastable state, let's say. So that dictates the motion. I mean, so that is like a minima. So there is a, uh, I mean, that, that particular minima is a basin of attraction for several finite temperature equilibrium configuration that you produce. So what you do is you want to map out the minima. Right, right. So that is, uh, sorry. So that is what I do here. I collect them. 
Now this is in trajectory, how does it look? So the actual Monte Car molecular dynamics trajectory was this, a particle was spending a lot of time here, then it moved out to here, spent some time again went there and then went back and so on and so forth. So I strip off all the small amplitude vibration in this thing. So this, I mean this is like looking at the trajectory at this energy minimized peaks. So that is the that is what is expected that that will tell me about the long time behavior. Okay, so that is the, that's the, that's the aim. So if I do that, so now what the standard thing that we do that we take this conf I mean this configuration, uh, I mean quench, these are called quench norm, sorry, quench normal mode analysis. So I do quench normal mode analysis and plot the dense, yeah. Oh, that is just uh, the molecular dynamic steps. Actually, these are probably not just the one step, but yeah, so several steps. Right, some window. And then you relax. You then I relax. Right, from each of them, and collect the one which is uh, which are all uh, I mean which are independent, and this is this plot. So now, okay. So now with this, what we want to do is we want to look at the I mean this is again standard in literature. You calculate what is called density of state. So you found all the energy eigenvalues, and these are energy minimized case. This is the Q and M. So this will be all positive energy eigenvalues, and then we'll look at various spectral properties of them to get further information. So this, and then other thing that people calculate is what is called a participation ratio, or oftentimes it's the inverse. I mean, this minus one will not be there. That's called inverse participation ratio. So what you calculate is the eigenvectors. I mean, so how many particles are contributing to the to the to the mode that you are talking about in each mode? Okay. So now that is given here. Uh, and then uh, there are few things to uh, notice which are interesting that there are some robust little little peaks which are there in, in this distribution participation ratio. So what turns out that the participation ratio is large, I mean large meaning modulo, uh, I mean so large meaning something like 0.35 or whatever, uh, greater than that for some modes, omega ranging between something and there are some which are uh, where the participation ratio is very small. So the one where, where the participation ratio is very small, we'll obviously call them localized mode because they don't, the particles don't move at all. And the one where the particles move, we'll call them delocalized mode, obviously. And then we try to call something in between which is quasi-localized mode. And it will probably be clear as we go along why you want to focus on them. So that is the region which is here, let's say. Some of them, I mean very narrow window of frequency. Similarly, it will be there at the higher part also. So those are quasi-localized mode. Is that a good thing? I mean, uh, so this is very ad hoc at this point. So it is indeed ad hoc. So we'll try to gather more information by looking into something else. So because this Hessian matrix are calculated with random position of particles, so you can think this matrix, matrices, Hessian matrices are, uh, I mean, they are a example of uh, uh, random matrix ensembles. I mean, if that is a fair thing to do, then you would expect that the energy level spacing will form, I mean will, will be classified according to the random matrix ensemble. Okay. So the one I mean which is and then you, you quickly get into that, I mean so the one which are delocalized modes, those I mean for them the energy level spacing which is defined by this, so this is the uh, successive energy eigenvalues and this is the average energy level spacing. So this thing, this distribution of S should be, I mean if it is a delocalized mode that should be Wigner distribution, uh, GOE distribution. The one which is localized that will form a Poisson distribution, independent events. So that's what we know. So now what we do, we take all the eigenvalues and do this analysis. And then again there are statist uh, very well defined statistical analysis by which you can really say whether, and remember this is without any parameter, I mean the, the uh, Poisson distribution or this thing comes without any fitting. So you can see whether your data falls within one class of, I mean it, it is one distribution or the other, I mean very well defined statistical taste, broadly taste is what it is called. So we find that indeed for, I mean so basically we try to fiddle with this range of omega where we are doing this and it turns out that in the same range I see Poisson distribution, so localized state in some regime. 
weak net distribution for the delocalized regime, and then in between there are data which, which does not follow either of them according to broad test. So this is somewhat reassuring that whatever we are saying just by looking at inverse participation ratio may not be all garbage. So now let us look at the representative mode. So it turns out what we are calling localized that these were most particles have no motion and then some has a motion. Yeah. Right, so that is what this Brody test does. I mean, so there is a for, there is in terms of another parameter. So that parameter value, if it is close to zero, less than something, then it is Poisson, and then, right. So that is what is exactly what is done. Okay. So so the representative modes, these are like localized mode. I mean, it is one of them. There are many modes which are qualitatively all similar. This is delocalized mode where every particle are making movement. So this is the I mean uh, polarization vector uh, that we are talking about. And these are these turn out to be one of the uh, quasi-localized mode where. So this is best represented here. So if I plot the magnitude of the polarization vector for delocalized mode, of course it is there everywhere. For uh, I mean the distribution looks like this. The one where it is localized is highly peaked. I mean peak near zero and then very long and uh, very small tail that you have. That is localized. Localized meaning it is very strongly localized. And then the one which you are calling quasi-localized, it is like having a I mean, if you think of this, this is like a spanning cluster. You will have like, a, like at least one spanning cluster that is moving across the system. Yet, there are many, many sites which are localized. So that's why this distribution has a sharp peak here and then a flat tail. So that is what we are trying to, uh, uh, yeah, so that turns out to be the quasi-localized. So now the other thing which is of importance, and that is the part where it is still, I mean, we are still making progress. So can there be a, a lane scale that you can associate with quasi-localized states? Uh, it's not completely done, but a very crude estimate you could do, you could define, you could take the magnitude of polarization vector and measure a correlation something like this. That magnitude of correlation at one side, uh, side differed by, uh, in distance by r and look at how it falls. And for delocalized mode, you have very weak, I mean, at least relatively weak R dependence. This is pretty large all over, as expected. For localized mode, this falls very, very sharply. And the other one, this thing falls uh, uh, with some, some, uh, some length scale. We are not yet associating too much importance, but that is what we want to do. So this is, this part is, uh, this is what is under progress, that you can do a, I mean, you can do something like a, uh, uh, cluster analysis to find, so basically these will be, I mean sometimes there are more clusters. So you can look at the distribution of the cluster sizes and from there you will probably get a better, better handle on the length scale. So that is what we are up to. But what is very interesting now and this is the, uh, this sort of the punchline of this, that what I said that there we wanted to find out how the long time displacements are correlated. So it turns out what you can do is exactly what I have written here. Take the particle whose displacement after time delta t, I mean from t0 to t0 plus delta t is one, I mean basically you identify the first particle. So for which the, which are the top 20% particle with large displacement. Identify the particles which move by significant dis distance, distances. And then calculate only at the initial time the quenched analysis where you take the top 20% particle which has the highest EI. EI is a sum of this eigenvector, eigenmode, but you restrict the sum heavily. I mean, you, you try to do as restricted as possible. Of course, you can get the displacement by keeping all the, all the modes. So it turns out that if you keep only the quasi-localized modes, then you can get a good correlation between this, uh, these two quantities. I mean, the long time displacement versus this. So that is represented here. So this has a very little correlation at small time. I mean, you, this is plotted. So this correlation of these two plotted as a function of time. So this is a very little correlation at very short times because very short time you only have random events which averages to zero. And then this, uh, this coherence sets in. So this goes up. And then finally, in the actual simulation, this comes down again at very, very large time. And then the, the it gets peaked at the time scale which are like the structural relaxes in time of the system. So over, and this is exactly what you expect. So this basically tells 
that the motion, long time motion, the real motion, I mean the, uh, in the quaint space, the motion is dictated by the local minima uh, of a particular uh, structure. So once the, it moves out of that, then the system relaxes. So until then, until that point, you can understand the behavior of the system by studying only the quasi-localized mode. So that's something which turns out from our uh, analysis. Uh, so that's uh, what we have here. I will not talk about this and just uh, sort of, uh, I mean, I will not again discuss this. So we are up uh, on to understanding the quantum melting of similar type. I mean, that's what we have been developing for some time. So, so the here, the new thing is I have the kinetic energy that makes the problem quantum. I mean, this is the zero point energy, but then it requires to develop a quantum Monte Carlo calculation. So now we have, so far we have describing things like at very small n, which is the quantum parameter, actually at n equals zero we are describing. So it's like this, ax we are going by this axis. So now we can go by that axis also, and basically the whole plane. And uh, we are uh, trying to look at various quantities. There are some results, some initial results that we had, and then some more. Uh, particularly we are now looking into, so that calculation was done for Boltzmann-on, that means you have quantum dynamics but not quantum statistics. So that way, I mean that's, I mean that's a theoretical particle called Boltzmann-on to check your uh, 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 simulation. And then we are on to fermions, uh, this is being uh, uh, progressed by uh, Anurag Banerjee and other student. Uh, so here we see the melting of course. Uh, spin half uh, this thing. So, so there are interesting things. I mean, we can identify some sort of a crossover uh, value of Rs uh, uh, for the melting. Rs meaning the potential versus kinetic energy. I mean, uh, uh, that's the interaction effect. So, what is very interesting that there are some identifier which says that there is melting and this has been done in literature for at least circular traps. Uh, however, some other thing like this Lindemann criteria shows a very, very smooth changeover. And it has a very healthy value even at a very large RS, I mean, where you are expected to have a solid. Uh, and uh, what is very interesting is that we have initial preliminary result, which says that the quantum fluctuations actually weakens the bond orientation order altogether. I mean, it's suppressed. You don't see this, uh, I mean, bond, I mean, if you were to calculate the bond orientation order, that will have very uh, little value. So we, are, we will be looking into this for some time. And now let me uh, acknowledge my collaborator, Bishuru, who is now wise man in wise man. Uh, he done most of the work, but much of these things started with uh, other student, Duti, who is also a postdoc now. And then this is the guy, Anurag Banerjee, who works with Pratap, also Pratap and Indranil. Uh, so who is driving the quantum melting part. And then among senior collaborators, I uh, benefited a lot by talking to Jayadev. Uh, Chakravarti at SNBO Center and more recently all these normal modes calculations are being done with uh, 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 close discussions with Chandan Das Gupta at ISC and we also get help from other people. Uh, this is my old uh, time collaborator. So the, I mean these, these people help me to or help us to understand and implement some part of quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, 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 so with that, I just put up the conclusion slide. I mean, everything I said, and I'll stop here. Sorry, I overshoot it uh, by five minutes or so. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Right. Right. So you can mimic your disorder like that. I mean, Langevin dynamics is what you do, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking going up in temperature, uh -huh. uh, noise would be changing. Right. So, so, so that is. Uh, I mean, so basically, in Langevin dynamics, you just do Newton's law, but you add a noise term, and that noise correlator you take to be proportional to temperature. So I think that is what you were. Right, yeah. so that also you uh, can, I mean, uh, so so you're asking whether that will be qualitatively different, is that what the question yeah, is? Uh, for example, some of these things which are suppressed by quantum mechanics that you're talking about, 
right the right i see yeah right so that is uh, that is certainly true that will happen so now i i, uh, I wanted to do i mean so the the thing is i didn't want to go that direction because that will not uh, not mess the ergodicity but if you have disorder that can uh, that can uh, i mean basically if you see glassiness i mean uh, maybe it is weakly broken yeah, but, uh, i think one thing that will happen is here your temperature is just coming in terms of initial uh -huh. uh, I see. Those things will, especially your dynamics, mm -hmm. would be the, uh, the way you get out of the case. At each point, there's a noise which tries to help you mm -hmm. make a jump. Uh, right. So okay. Whether some of those things will uh, change. Uh, right. No, I understand. Okay. Uh, in especially in terms of the dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't that know the answer. Right. Yeah. That is easier to do. That is easier to do for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that will be in, that will be interesting. So one thing that we see, and you you are probably right. I mean, I didn't. So the, there is a big difference in classical and quantum picture. I mean, whatever we have. So quantum mechanics just diffuses the particle. I mean, if you take that, and classical also diffuses, but through this selected selective paths and so on and so forth. This, of course, can be addressed exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that 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 one can get a good uh, intuition for, right? Yeah. And probably, given that you have all the machinery, it's probably not that hard for you to do that. Really. Right. Yeah. So that yeah, that can certainly. I don't know whether it's hmm. interesting in that answer. Right. So the dynamics, as I have written, the last point. This is sort of futuristic classical versus quantum dynamics in observable. So this is a good check. And also the defects. I mean, this is something that we have started looking into, and there's this uh, experiment from Pratap's group, uh, as well as some other experiment, which says that you have the hexaticity uh, region actually expands uh, if you have uh, disorder. So it's actually very interesting because you will normally think that the, if you if you think of defects like uh, KTH NY theory defects. So they they are actually by unbinding unbinding transition. But when you have disorder, you will have defects even at zero temperature, and they are not thermal defect. So that might even nucleate region of defect. So so the nature of transition can also change in terms of defect. So that's something which is uh, yeah. Ha, sure. Uh. Sorry. If I understood right, your, your motion meant that uh, there were these configurations that could be thought of as excitations around some classical mm -hmm. minimum. Uh -huh. And for a while, you rattle around one classical minimum, then you jump to another, and, and so on. Mm. Right. Now, around each of the classical minima, you also computed these uh, normal modes. Mm -hmm. uh, does computing the normal modes help you to see which direction the next jump will? You're saying softer modes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Could you sort of predict mm -hmm. from the normal mode where you will jump next? In fact, if you can, you might want to do that and then this can guide your dynamics right. faster along all your traffic. Right. Like yeah, I haven't looked into that, but I think this can be done. I mean, uh, uh, Right. But does that always necessarily, I mean, because it depends on how steep these things are changing around the minimum. Whether this will always dictate you to jump, for you to jump to one of the minimum. So that's a question about how long the minimum. Right. So the thing is, if you look at a short time, this we know that at least, OK, I, this is not really an answer to your question, but at least our characterization is no good. because. Because at short time, the motions, as you say, are just vibrational, going back and forth. So that is not captured, at least by this quasi-localized mode. Now, 
so now so you have quasi local i mean qualitatively you have quasi localized mode localized modes and delocalized mode delocalized modes will probably be no good either because those are like uh, large uh, large frequency modulation so that will also average to zero so as you move from one minimum to the other, you are moving a substantial number of the modulation. Right. So, I would have expected something like the delocalized mode, like a low frequency delocalized mode to be telling you roughly where you will move next. Okay, in a short time, yes, uh, mean, maybe. Yeah. Time. I mean, there is some uh, fluctuation, there is the oscillation time and then there is the jump time. Mm -hmm. So, over the jump time, it is it's very brief. Right, okay. Yeah, it will be worth looking into. Okay. I mean, this can be calculated in principle. Thanks. Okay. okay.